we get a flat tire, we say the enemy's winning. (laughs) Paul the Apostle, shipwrecked, imprisoned, abandoned, rejected, talked about, misunderstood, beaten, sick, standing before councils, victorious. Well, you know, my relationships just don't seem to work out. I'm under the power of the enemy. Why? Because we confuse circumstance, exterior issues for internal victory or internal standing. And the moment we begin to believe that life's circumstances are evidence that God has abandoned us, then we're under the power of a lie. Do you know the power of an endorsement? If a New York Times best-selling author endorses a novel, that will boost the sales. If a political candidate endorses a newcomer, that increases votes. If a professional athlete endorses a brand, that brand gets more sales. That's the power of an endorsement. Here's the thing. The enemy will use your negative circumstances in life to endorse his lies. It says, there's proof you're cursed. There's proof you're under my power. There's proof God's abandoned you. There's proof you're not fully delivered. It's getting quiet in here. <laughs> That's his proof. And he, he uses that to endorse it. And what do we do? We grant that premise. Yes, I am defeated. Now, how do I break through? Instead of saying, no, even in this, I'm still victorious. Because, because then what happens now is you're chasing a solution that doesn't exist because there's a problem that the enemy has convinced you is real. I told you we were going deep. Do you see how intertwined his lies become with our thinking? Now, again, let me emphasize. Yes, he spiritually attacks us. Absolutely. Yes, he tempts us. Yes, he tries to deceive. All those things. Yes, people will come against you. We understand that. But what I'm saying is that those things are not proof that God has abandoned you. Those things are not proof that the enemy is winning. When you face those things, those aren't opportunities for sorrow. What does James 1 say? These are opportunities for great joy. Thinking, well, that seems backwards, but it's not. Because we have this sense of entitlement that we should get everything we want all the time from God or else it's just something's not working. My friend, he never promised a life of perfection. He promised his presence in the midst of the storm. Yes, we believe in miracles. Yes, we believe in blessing. Yes, God is a good God. But when those things don't work out the way we want them to, These aren't proof that God has abandoned us. These aren't proof that the enemy is winning. These are opportunities to build the character of Christ within us. 2. Open doors and how they make way for strongholds. Christians can be attacked and should watch for open doors. Let's go to Matthew 12, an often misapplied portion of Scripture. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest, but finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home, empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. A few things we can glean from this portion of scripture is that when an unclean spirit comes out of someone, that is, it is cast out of them, it goes through the desert, so it's bound to the earth. It seeks rest. That means it grows tired outside of a host. It needs a physical host in order to have strength. And then what does the scripture say? Then it says they can speak. I will, it has a will. Return to the person I came from, it has a memory. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. They're observant. They observe the state of your spiritual life. Now watch this. It returns and finds the former home, what? Three things. Empty, swept, and in order. Who lives in you? 
as a born again believer, we are, you are, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's Romans 8, 9. Is the believer empty? This is not talking about the born again believer. However, please don't allow that to produce apathy. Here's, here's two extremes that Christians live in. One extreme is I call hyper paranoia. They see a demon in everything. They go to the thrift store and get a coat. And if they have a bad week, they go, it must be the coat. I got to get this thing off me. <laughs> My friend, if there's a demon on the coat, the moment you put it on, it jumped off. Okay, because the Holy Spirit in you is greater than the spirit who's in the world. Okay, that, that, that's paranoia. But wait a minute. There's the other side. There's the believer who says, well, I have the Holy Spirit. I can do whatever I want. And then they're participating in worldly things, thinking it's not going to affect them. No, neither of these extremes are biblical. So even though a spirit cannot re-enter a believer in the same way that it can re-enter an unbeliever, that doesn't mean they don't come back to check for what they can have. And what can they have? The power of deception. And so they make their rounds and they come back and look at your life and they say, how can I attack this person in a way that's going to be effective? And this is why there's seasons of life where you do well and then when you begin to think a certain way, you neglect the word, you neglect prayer, old habits now begin to reform. When you thought those nightmares and torments stopped, suddenly they're reappearing. You thought you shook that depression, suddenly now... That weight is coming back on you. By the way, not that depression is something you could just shake off. There are other elements to it, of course. We'll talk about maybe in this um, course. But the Bible makes it clear that demonic powers will go. And what do they do? They call for help, meaning they cooperate with one another. There's structure. There's a system. More evil than itself. They're ranked by how evil they are. And they, they know it. And so... When the enemy comes back to the life of the believer, he finds, you're not empty, so I can't re-enter, but that doesn't mean all my attacks are ineffective. Again, two extremes. Not so paranoid, you know, oh, I went to the market and I touched the cereal box, who knew where it came from? Maybe this thing's attached to me now and it's hiding in my elbow. <laughs> Guys, we have to grow out of that. We have to grow out of that, okay? But, but on the other side... Oh, you know, I watched that movie with occultic imagery, but I have the Holy Spirit, so nothing can happen. My friend, you're playing with fire. You see the two extremes. One is based in fear. The other is based in pride. Neither of those are biblical. Okay, so how do we ground ourselves? The word. Okay, so what can they do? When they come back to check, they look for ways that you're most vulnerable to deception. And here's the reality. When you participate in wicked things, you are doing things to your mind you do not realize. Why do you, why do you suppose they hide this in children's cartoons? Why do you suppose they hide it in the movies? Because it's so powerful that even just hidden, those messages can affect the way you think. Well, they can't re-enter me. You're right, they can't re-enter you. But you're opening a door to deception. And that deception wreaks havoc in your life. Now, open door number one, your connections. These are your relationships with other people. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 says, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Now, balance in all things. Mark 2, 17. Who did Jesus hang out with? Sinners. Did he hang out with sinners to affirm them in their sin? By no means. He would hang out with sinners that he might bring transformation to their lives. That he might be the light in their dark places. Okay, so I'm not suggesting that we quarantine the gospel. I'm not saying that you need to go rent a lake house in the hills, disconnect from everyone and everything, lest you be contaminated by their evil spirits. I shook their hand, 